Mom, seriously, I'm trying to make a video. Can you give me one minute? Oh, let's try this again. Hi, and welcome to the Spring Hill Equine Seminar. If you're new, like me, don't worry. It's gonna be fun. We'll give everyone a chance to grab some food and get comfy, and then we'll get started. Mom, I'm working here. You're always embarrassing me. Okay, I think we're about ready to go. Um, so just reiterating, um, forage is the most important aspect of a horse's diet. <clears throat> um, and horses that are fed strictly a hay only diet would be fed, could be fed up to 20 pounds a day if they're a thousand pound adult horse, which is what the majority of us own. Um, that math gets a bit more complicated, one where feeding horses concentrates like grains because the fiber in that type of diet um, would reduce the amount of total hay that we're feeding. Um, and then just to keep in mind, um, I know growing up myself, I always was very diligent in taking time switching over grain for my horse's feed, but for hay, I never really thought about it. And we have found and we see being um, vets out in the field that hay changes can really contribute um, to colic in horses and especially during the winter time when we're adding um, a lot more hay to their diet once the grass dies, um, horses can be prone to colic and especially impaction colic. Um, and it's also important to keep in mind, even if you have the same hay, a different cutting of that hay like Timothy um, also needs to be mixed in gradually over time. Um, and then just taking a side step in the importance of weighing our feed. Um, and I like to use this illustration because um, it really drove it home for me. 
um, the difference of volume in a pound of feathers versus the volume of a pound of lead. And so when we're thinking about the different types of flakes that we have um, in each bale of hay, some of those flakes can be really thick and heavy and others can be kind of puny and kind of fall apart. Um, so that kind of plays into the importance of actually weighing our hay and um, also our grain later on in the talk. Um, but just thinking it takes a lot of feathers to get a pound, but only a little bit of lead to get a pound. Um, and this is just kind of an example. Um, the hay bale on the left you can see has really thick, heavy flakes, but the one on the right is really small. So if it's one of those things where it's like, well, I feed my horse two flakes of hay twice a day, um, those ones on the right, they're probably gonna be losing weight, but the ones on the left, they could be gaining weight with that. And so what I like to do is put my hay um, in a hay net and then weigh it with either a luggage, um, a luggage scale, or um, you can purchase some of these uh, hay feeder or hay scales at your tax store. Um, and then kind of going, uh, moving forward, there's different types of hay, which can get confusing, but um, generally they fall into two different types of categories. One being grass hay, which includes um, different hay such as Timothy, Orchard, or Coastal, um, and our legumes, which can include hay such as alfalfa or peanut. Um, and occasionally you can get bales that are mixed with both. Um, so then the question comes, what does your horse need? And this can be um, kind of a complex question depending on one, your body condition score of your horse. If they are ideal, a little underweight or a little overweight, that will change the type and also the quantity of the feed that we are providing. Um, the age, the workload of the horse, um, whether they're growing, such as if they're weanlings or yearlings, um, or whether or not you have a pregnant mare. Um, and so I'm just gonna kind of go over some broad um, kind of nutrition facts about the different types of hay. Um, and so alfalfa, which is a legume, is usually the hay that you're reaching for that is like dense in protein and calories. Um, coastal hay is a grass hay. Um, it's a lower quality hay, has less calories. Um, so this might be a hay if you have an overweight um, animal or an easy keeper. Sometimes coastal hay um, can be ideal for them um, because we want them to be able to eat, eat forage and kind of scavenge, um, but we don't want them to have some of the side effects that can come with being overweight, such as lam laminitis. Um, coastal hay um, is known to have um, a higher risk for colic, um, but to combat that, mixing in a small amount, about a quarter or 25% of a legume such as alfalfa can reduce that risk of colic. Um, and then Timothy and Orchard, I uh, kind of group together. They generally have lower calories and protein, um, but they tend to vary greatly depending on the cut, such as first or second cut. Um, I said I was mentioning general characteristics of the hay previously because the only way we can know for sure um, the content of the hay is to do a hay analysis. Um, but unfortunately, unless you have a large herd and you're ordering tons of hay at a time, um, it's not necessarily practical because you have to take about 10 samples of different parts of your hay. Um, to do an analysis, and sometimes you're not even gonna have 10 bales if you only have one horse. Um, if you were to do a hay analysis, the company that I'm most familiar with is Equi Analytical, and you can see that online. Um, and then overall, if you have any questions or concerns or not sure where to start with feeding your diet, we're happy to help. Um, and that's gonna transition us into concentrates. Someone wants to play nice in the sandbox. Everybody happy with my microphone? Everybody? Everybody? All right. So we're going to talk about concentrates. Um, for those of us over the age of the
If you're feeding all stock right now, stop what you're doing. We're going to get you a different feed. Feeds in general, concentrates, come in three different categories. These are sort of representatives of those categories. It's that, it's like I said, middle of the road. Then we have means like pro force fuel. Pro force fuel is a whole thing. I'm not up on the medical ground as well, sorry. But anyway, they are the gas station is the 1930 oxygen. They are the more power, more power, more energy, and more all the things per pound, per bag. Most of us do not use more power per bag. So think about what you want to do. And then the third category of feeds are your own winter example I put up here from Buckeye, which we call a ration balancer. Ration balancers are what I should eat if I was a horse, and they are a vitamin, protein, and mineral package. So it's all the things you need to survive with minimal calories. So if you were a human, you should be a well-balanced salad. And that's what you should eat. And, and most of our listeners should probably be on a ration balancer. So let's talk about why. So when you walk into the feed store and you see that there are 50 different kinds of That has been then been tweaked tweak, because, tweak, because, because horses don't eat horses, 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 and we have certain things that we really like to eat. But these are all the only things we have to eat. So let's talk about what happens when you feed the horses. Horses are going to be eating the horses. So on the top, we have strategies. So feeding the horses. 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 So
I'm going to make sure. Can everybody hear me? I'm going to do a little song and dance up here until I know that everyone can hear me. Not much dancing because it's not really what I do. All right. Concentrate. Let's talk about concentrates um, again. So <laughs> concentrates is another word for grain. I grew up being told that we fed horses grain and what I fed them looked like grain. Now what we feed is concentrates. And that's because it is a mix of grains, vitamins, proteins, and minerals to get your horse a complete diet. And this is how I like to think about concentrates. So forage should be most of the, the puzzle pieces in your horse's diet. So you should have, when you look at how much they eat in a day, most of it should be forage. We are then going to use concentrate to fill in the gaps. And that's all it's there for. Concentrate should not be the base of your diet, just as Dr. Carter said. No concentrate has been formulated to be the base of your horse's diet. They've all been formulated to be gap fillers. And now my favorite slide, you guys can see it again. Uh, all stock feeds are good for no stock. I don't know why they make all stock feeds. Like, and, and they're fun to look at the tags on because a horse should eat like 12 pounds. No, it was like 24 pounds of this a day when we looked at the tag. It was crazy what they should eat. So on this bag, there's a cow and a sheep and a goat. And probably on the back, it says that it can be fed to horses and it can't be fed to any of those. It's not a good diet for any of them. This is going to McDonald's and getting cheeseburgers every day and thinking that's a complete diet. It's not good, don't do it. Okay, stepping off my soapbox. All right, let's talk about the three basic categories of concentrate and that's what these feeds represent. So on the left, we have strategy which is a middle of the road feed. It covers maintenance needs for most horses that are in some level of work and are not super easy keepers. It's a great place to start. The next feed over is Pro Force Fuel. That's your 93 octane. That's high power, high calorie, all of the things in a bag that most of us probably don't need because at the end of the day, if I ask myself, honestly, I don't need more power. I don't need more speed. I probably don't need more calories when it comes to my horse. So I probably don't need Pro Force Fuel for her. And she is a relatively easy keeper. So these are high calorie, she's gonna get fat. The next category over is what we call ration balancers. And that on this one, we're using grow and win. Those are all of the vitamins, minerals, and proteins your horse needs. And that's it in a teeny tiny package. So there's no extra calories in this feed. This is a balanced salad. This is like adding dressing on top of your salad that has vitamins, minerals, and proteins. So you're giving your hay for your horse and then you're putting a balancing dressing on there. And these are the only three categories of feed. When you walk into the feed store and you see 50 different bags, they are all in some way in this grouping. So they're either gonna be sort of a maintenance middle of the road, they're gonna be high test, or they're gonna be a ration balancer diet food. So that's, that's all every one of them, them is, are, anyway they have different consistencies and makeups because humans feed horses. And we are certain that our preference is the one that our horse likes best. Not necessarily true, but the feed companies have taken how humans think and factored it into the diets that they, they formulate. So you're pretty okay. You just need to be aware that there's three basic formulas and think about your horse. So let's talk about feeding these three basic formulas. We're back where we, we ended up. Okay, so in the middle there, in the red and white, are the feeding directions for strategy. So if we look down, for a 1,200-pound horse, in light work, that horse needs 6.75 pounds of feed a day. That means that horse needs to eat that amount of food in the day in order to meet all of its vitamin, mineral, and protein needs. And this is really important because this is how they grow good feet, they have good hair coats, they can repair their muscles, they can do all the things we need them to do with the nutrition we give them if we give them 6.75 pounds. If they're a super easy keeper and they're gaining too much weight on that and we give them two pounds, we've taken that gap that's in their diet from forage 
and we've only put a little tiny pebble in it. We haven't put the entire puzzle piece in. We've still left giant gaps in their diet if we're not meeting that. So these, this information is on the back of every bag of feed you get. It's on the tag for every bag of feed. This information is somewhere, everywhere you look. So the bottom left there where it says feeding instructions, that is ProForce fuel. So that feed, you can see that same 1200 pound horse has a much wider range. So ProForce fuel probably has higher uh, proteins, vitamins and mineral levels in it so that you can feed less of it, but it does have very high calories per pound. So if I can get away with feeding that horse three pounds at maintenance, that means I've got a lot more calories in there as well to meet that need. Next, we're gonna look at ration balancers, which is the one on the bottom right. And you'll see that for those guys, they should be getting one to two pounds a day. So not a lot. And that's because this one is literally only the things they need to fill that gap, no extra calories. So when you're looking at what feed you get, you need to decide which horse you drive. Do you ride the Ferrari and no one cares about the miles per gallon on the Ferrari? For most of us, this is thoroughbreds. If we think about thoroughbreds, they have been bred for hundreds of years to be the Ferraris of the wealthy. You know, like they went out to the racetrack and you showed off your thoroughbred and you said, mine's faster than yours. And no one cared how many miles per gallon the Ferrari got, didn't matter. And so over time, their metabolism has evolved to be very high. I am not a thoroughbred. So I can't go around eating ProForce fuel every day. However, the thoroughbred that I own has to eat ProForce fuel just to meet his calorie needs to stand in the pasture and be retired because he has that high a metabolism. If I put him on something like a ration balancer where I have minimal calories and I'm just filling in the gaps in the, the vitamins and minerals, then he loses weight horrifically and I'm worried that I'm gonna get the sheriff called on me because I'm gonna have a rescue case. So that's where paying attention to what your horse is is really important to decide what you're feeding. Versus if you've got a smart car here. You don't drive a smart car because you wanna beat the person next to you off the line at the stoplight. You drive a smart car because you want fuel efficiency, you wanna get where you're going, you want cheap. Uh, you know, there's some reasons why you drive a smart car that are different. And for many of the breeds that we use on a regular basis, they were the smart cars. If you look at any of the pony breeds, they were actually developed to work in coal mines, uh, to do farming, low level farming in very, very, very poor areas. You know, like if you think about the moors of Scotland, they're not a fertile area. So you used small horses with slow metabolisms because you didn't need to feed them as much. If you were a draft horse, you were a working horse and everything that you ate literally came off your owner's table. And so you needed to have a slow metabolism so that you didn't cost your owners too much money. And so we've developed many of our breeds are more smart car than they are Ferrari. So we need to keep that in mind when we're choosing what we feed. And as always, if you have any questions about what you feed, then you should give us a call and ask. And now we're gonna talk about dogs and cats and we're gonna see if the microphones are gonna cooperate just once tonight. All right, can everybody hear me? I'll pause for a moment so we can get some answers in the comments before we have to repeat ourselves. Well, all right, well, I'm Dr. Spizak. For those of you who don't know, let me know if you can hear me. Um, I am just gonna talk about small animals today. Um, I did cover goat and sheep nutrition in my goat and sheep um, webinars. We're good, okay, perfect. Um, so we're not covering goat and sheep tonight, but um, go check our YouTube or Facebook for those sort of recordings. So we're gonna talk about small animal nutrition tonight. So we've got a dog and a cat on our screen. They are two different species. Um, I'm gonna lump a lot of my recommendations together as far as how you choose the appropriate food for your dog or a cat. But um, the, the big reminder is that they are different species. So the big thing is that dogs shouldn't be eating cat food and cats shouldn't be eating dog food. They should both be eating species specific food. I don't think the all stock bags say they can feed dogs, but please, for the love of God, don't feed a dog all stock food. I don't think that would go very well. Um, 
So unlike horses, dogs and cats are sort of carnivores slash omnivores. Um, they, dogs have for sure developed to be domesticated. So we'll talk a little bit later about how your dog is not a wolf, um, despite what the commercials may want to tell you. Um, cats, a little bit less domesticated. Cats just sort of allow us to live with them. They don't really, you know, they don't follow our rules. Um, so cats are considered obligate carnivores. And what that means is that they have to have meat in their diet. So there's there's no vegetarian cat foods. Um, they have to have meat in their diet in order to function. And that's one of the reasons there's a specific nutrient called taurine. Um, and that's one of the reasons why cats need to eat cat food um, is because that nutrient is appropriately put into cat foods. Um, so the, the big message here, two different species, but we're going to talk about the recommendations somewhat similarly. So um, the banner on the bottom of the screen here is AFCO. You guys may have heard of, about that before. Um, and they are an organization, they're an independent organization. They're the Association of American Feed Control Officials. Now, despite the name, they are not necessarily a regulatory agency that has like police officers out there at the pet food stores, you know, pulling bags off the shelves and putting caution tape up. They can't stop uh, pet foods companies from, from marketing or selling food. What they do is they set definitions for what is allowed to be put on the bag and what things are defined as. And so any food that you purchase for your dog or cat at the barest bare minimum needs to have what is called an AFCO label. You'll typically see it in black and white on the back of the bag. It'll have the AFCO acronym somewhere on it, and it'll have one of these three statements. Um, so the, the top one is formulated to meet the nutritional levels um, sort of established by the nutrient profiles. And you see for life stage there, that's gonna be either for adults dog or cat, um, for growing dog or cat, or you will have some foods that say all life stages. All life stages foods are a little bit like all stock foods where they're not necessarily perfect for any life stage. If anything, they're better for, they're formulated for puppies or kittens because those have higher nutrient requirements than adults. Um, this middle, this middle statement is animal feeding tests using um, these procedures basically say that they provide a complete and balanced. Um, and then the bottom one says uh, provide complete and balanced nutrition for the life stage and is comparable to a product that has been substantiated. So um, the middle option is our best option. That means that that food has actually been used in a feeding trial um, and been shown that it can actually feed the dog or the cat for a period of time and keep them healthy and they don't get any nutritional deficiencies. So that's the best one. I will say that very much not all of the foods in the stores have done a feeding trial. Um, you know, reason being just like with horse foods, there's kind of a couple of categories of food. And so um, if a food is close enough, they'll use one of these other labels. But that's something that's kind of the bare minimum to take a look at. The next thing that we use when we are evaluating what food to feed our dog or cat are some guidelines established by this organization, so the World Small Animal Veterinary Association. Um, they do a really good job, and they've got a website with lots of really great sort of client-facing material, if you're curious about any of this, um, for how to evaluate your pet's food. Because just like with horse feed, there are a million bags out there, a million companies out there. So we've got a couple questions to go over. Um, first one, most important one in my opinion, is does that company employ a full-time boarded pet nutritionist um, in order to help formulate their diets? And so there are some people in pet stores that claim to be pet nutritionists. Those are different than full-time boarded, meaning they took a really long, really intense board exam, um, pet nutritionists that have a PhD. Who formulates the food? What are their credentials? Sort of a similar question there. As we talked about before with our AFCO labels, again, that's the barest bare minimum, but Wasaba is reminding us that we need to know, are those diets tested using AFCO feeding trials? If you go to PetSmart or Pet Supermarket or whatever, probably every bag in their store is going to have an AFCO label, but um, on the big wide world of the internet, there are definitely some foods out there that do not have an AFCO label, and maybe in some sort of boutique stores, they don't, they don't follow that either. Um, where are the foods produced and manufactured? Can the company answer that question? 
Um, and then what specific quality control measures do they use? Um, I am not gonna talk about prescription diets in here with any more detail, but one of the things that I'll mention is that um, you know, we, can, we have prescription diets in small animal medicine. Those end up being both a diagnostic and a treatment um, modality all at the same time. And typically for things like food allergy. Um, and one of the big reasons why we actually use a prescription diet and not just let's say a diet that um, has a novel protein in it sort of from the pet store, so like a kangaroo-based diet, is that the prescription diets, those factories that create the, the dog and cat food, those um, conveyor belts are run through two entire times with no food on them and are cleaned very, very thoroughly before that actual prescription diet goes across. And there are very stringent quality control measures that allow that to happen and give us confidence that what is on the bag is, is what in fact is in the bag. Um, versus the, the company that advertises a chicken diet and a kangaroo diet will run the chicken diet and then go ahead and run the kangaroo diet and those crumbs will all mix together. Um, there have been a couple of different really nice studies done that have shown that chicken exists in every single over-the-counter pet food, no matter what is on the label. Um, so will they provide a complete nutrient analysis? Um, again, similar to horse feed, that's always on the back. Um, some of the more boutique type dog and cat feed, not always on the bag, but sketchy. And then very importantly, what is the caloric value per gram, can, and cup? Um, so we don't typically weigh um, dog and cat food just because that would get really complicated really fast. Um, and so we, we tend to go either by cup, which does need to be, again, an actual measuring cup, not a you know big gulp cup or one of those. Um, and then per gram and can tends to get more on the cat food side of things. Um, and then what actual product research has been conducted? And so what has that company done to ensure that the choices that they're making, hopefully that their board certified pet nutritionist is making, um, are, are the right choices for to feed your dog or your cat? All right. We're going to go on two soapboxes slash hot topics in um, dog and cat nutrition. If you are on Facebook, you may have heard some things. If you're on TikTok, this particular thing is quite popular out there. Um, there are tons of TikTok pet nutritionists that love to give you the, you know, the down low on what to feed your pet. And they say raw food, raw food. You have to feed raw food because these are the same, right? Your little Bichon and your big giant wolf, totally the same. They're not. So domesticated dogs, even huskies, even Malamutes, even German shepherds that sort of kind of maybe look like wolves are not wolves. They do not need raw food. Um, they have developed with humans. They, you know, yes, wolves came to the campfire thousands of years ago, but the food at the campfire was being cooked and they decided that they liked the cooked food and they chose to stay and they developed into the dogs that we know and love today who do need cooked food. The short answer, and if um, I see your dog or cat on an appointment, I'm happy to talk to you about the longer answers, but the short answer is that there has been absolutely zero benefits proven with raw food in dogs or cats with multiple studies, and we know that harm can come from that raw food, both to your dog or cat and also to you. This is the CDC's statement on raw food. Um, so they say that they do not recommend feeding raw diets. Things like salmonella and listeria, there are some others too, but those are some big ones that can transfer to people. Um, they have been found in raw pet foods. That includes the raw packaged diets that are sold. Um, and, and that can definitely make your pet sick. Even if it doesn't make your pet sick though, it can make you sick. You're potentially preparing that food in the same kitchen that you're preparing your own food. Um, and your dog may or may not lick your mouth, your cat may or may not sleep on your pillow, and that that raw bacteria can definitely transfer. So stepping off the soapbox, uh, the first soapbox for me, um, don't feed raw. All right, DCM. This is a acronym that you may or may not have heard about. It stands for dilated cardiomyopathy. You might be saying, I thought this was a nutrition talk. Why are we talking internal medicine, cardiology related topics? Well, the last five or 10 years, there's been kind of a big uproar in the pet food industry, mostly the dog food industry, about dilated cardiomyopathy. This is a disease that occurs to the heart, as you might have guessed from the, the name, and it causes a reduced ability of the heart to pump because the, the chambers actually get really, really large. And so again, why on earth am I talking about this right now? Well, 
Um, historically, it's been genetically linked. We've got a couple of breeds that are predisposed to this, and so we know that those dogs can get it. We, we watch for it, we, we do extra screening tests, all of that good stuff. For the past five or 10 years, um, the FDA and a lot of cardiologists around the country have been finding um, a major, major, major uptick of this disease in breeds that are not predisposed for it. So breeds that we've never seen this disease in before, and that is terrifying because this disease is no fun. Um, and we have learned that there is a diet link. Now, the research is still out on the exact cause, but we've got a lot of um, clues and so we are, we are trying to be as safe as possible, and I'm gonna give you some recommendations to be as safe as possible to avoid this in your dog. Um, without getting too much into the weeds, foods do cause DCM, and we have shown that by when a dog is diagnosed with DCM, if we remove them from the offending diet, we can actually get a reversal of the symptoms. So that is fairly strong evidence that it is very much caused by the diet. So this is a little graphic. It basically shows you um, we've got a healthy heart on the left. And so that's the four chambers of the heart, um, nice and normal and symmetrical. And then the DCM heart kind of looks like a bell pepper. That is definitely not how your heart is supposed to look. The chambers get really, really thin, really weak, and they cannot get the blood. Um, and dogs can die from this for sure. So um, this is a, a a lot of words on this slide, I know. Um, take a screenshot if you wanna read it later. Um, but this is sort of two really good tips on um, trying to, to avoid the possibility of your dog getting DCM. At the moment, the way the research is going, we are thinking that ingredients um, such as peas, lentils, and chickpeas are potentially one of our culprits. One of the first things that we linked DCM to was grain-free food because grain-free became a big, a big diet fad in the pet food industry five or 10 years ago. Um, also a reminder that um, your dog's do, do need grains and grain-free is not really a thing um, that we need to worry about. And so grain-free was sort of linked to it. We've done more research. We're worried now that peas, lentils, and chickpeas and some other ingredients may be um, one of the biggest issues. And so really good idea is avoiding those ingredients um, as far as being in the, in the highest part of that ingredient label. Um, the other thing is gonna be avoiding manufacturers, so specific brands that have had a lot of cases. And so the FDA has published their research and basically this is done um, with cardiologists where they're diagnosing this diet associated DCM and they are finding out what food that pet is on and they're publishing that research and so we know kind of what, what brands to be a little bit worried about. And it is very much associated with what we call boutique brands. So those smaller brands that do a little bit less research on their products. Um, so we've got some of them bolded here. I'll let you guys kind of read through those, but um, safe to say they're all kind of somewhat smaller brands, but usually brands that spend a lot of money on advertising. So they've got great ads, they're emotional, they advertise in the Super Bowl. It's very heart, you know, heart wrenching. Um, except it really is heart-wrenching because their diets may cause heart disease. Um, the little plug at the bottom left here, this is actually one of my classmates. She's got a website. She actually has made DCM in food a little bit of her passion project, and she's got a ton of really, really good resources. I borrowed some of this from her. So if you've got more questions about it, um, alltradesdvm.com is her, her website. So just a little plug there. Okay, so what can I feed? I just told you a lot of things you can't feed. Oh my gosh, what can I feed? So. You want to choose a manufacturer that does nutrition research. You want to have um, a board certified pet nutritionist. You want to have really good quality control. Um, and you want to have a brand that you can trust and that your veterinarian trusts. We've got three really, really good ones right here. Um, we've got Hills Science Diet. We have got Royal Canin. And we have got Purina. Those three all meet all of those requirements. They have also been around the block. They've been pet food brands for a really, really long time. Um, I just realized I chose all dog foods. It does apply to cat foods as well. Um, I'm just a little biased. I've got two dogs and one cat, so, you know, dogs. But um, so uh, they're really, really, really good brands. They make um, both prescription diets, all three of them do, as well as maintenance diets. Um, if you want to, you know, cater to your special interest of your breed. Royal Canin specifically has some great breed specific foods where they've done even more research to try to kind of find out what, you know, a golden retriever needs versus Doberman, Doberman Pinscher and all of that. So these are the three brands that your veterinarian is going to recommend. Now, 
Um, I have heard many, many times when I've made those recommendations that I must have been bought by the pet food company and they must have paid my tuition. And if they did, I, let my bank know because I still have loans. Um, but they do not pay us to say this. And in fact, if one of them paid us, it'd be weird for me to recommend all three to you equally. I love all of these brands. My cat is on Royal Canaan and my dogs are on Hills. They're all great. Um, those are my recommendations for you. So a little bit more generic, wet or dry food. Um, I get that question a lot, especially with cats. Um, people are very concerned about whether to feed wet or dry food. What do I do? Do I add water to the dry food? Do I feed wet food on Sundays and dry food the rest of the week? What do I do? Um, the short answer is you feed what your animal wants to eat. Um, some cats don't want one, some cats do want the other. Um, Dry food, probably better for teeth as long as they actually chew it. My cat inhales his dry food, so I don't know that it does anything for his teeth. Wet food may or may not be better in things like diabetes or kidney disease. Adding water to the food is always a good thing. Cats are, are desert creatures by nature, and so they don't um, drink a lot of water. So um, adding water to the food is generally always good, even dry food. Um, Wet food is great to encourage animals to eat. If they don't want to eat, you can zap it in the microwave for six or seven seconds. Um, really great option. You can definitely do dry up with wet on top, um, but either is okay. My recommendation, yes, quite, uh, I was going to say, my recommendation is when you've got a young animal, so a puppy or kitten, expose them to both. So offer your puppy or kitten both wet and dry. That way, if they get older and your veterinarian does tell you that they need to be on a wet or a dry, they've experienced that food at some point in their life and they're more likely to tolerate it. Is there a question? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is about um, a cat who's doing cat things and eating super fast and then vomiting it all up. Um, and the, these people have gotten a, a slow feed bowl, but they're just wondering sort of what to do about that. Um, I like to kind of experiment with that. One of the things um, that, that with cats, especially, especially if you either only have one cat or you only have cats in your house, is teaching them to forage. And so actually hiding food, usually it's dry food because it's the least messy, but hiding food in toys or on cat trees and on surfaces all around your house and then letting them forage and find that food throughout the day. That's one of the most healthy, both mentally and physical ways for a cat to eat. It can be challenging if you have a dog that will find those th places first, or if you have multiple cats where one is gonna gorge more than the other one. Um, with my own cat is a, is a gorger, um, and he, he's on a timed feeder because he will wake me up at four in the morning if he doesn't get fed, um, but if he got fed by me. And so, but something that I used to do with him was I would put him in a room for a few minutes and I would just spread his kibble like all throughout the house and then I would let him go. And that sort of forces them to slow down even more than a slow feeder. Um, but slow feeders are great. Uh, food puzzles, food toys are great. The other thing that I'll, I'll totally do in a cat if they're willing, um, more of a dog recommendation usually, is putting the food in something, adding some water and freezing it. So they've got to really, really work at it. Um, but you can definitely try wet food. You could try wet food and freezing it, and they have to lick it up and kind of eat it even slower, um, things like that. But I would try foraging with that cat that's vomiting. Um, and, and sort of spreading the food all throughout the house. And then my, my thing that I have to say, because I'm a veterinarian, is that cats vomiting regularly is generally not normal. So also visiting your normal veterinarian to make sure that there's not a medical reason that your cat's vomiting. Good, cool. Okay, so um, now my question for you all is if I had a magical pill that I could sell you for your dog or your cat, and it would make them live longer, it would make them live um, less painful lives, it would make them happier, and it would make them healthier, how much would you pay for it? Probably probably a fair, a fair amount, right? Um, so I don't have that pill, unfortunately. I'm working on it. What I do know, and what we do know from research, is that keeping our dogs and cats, and our horses, at appropriate weights, not overweight and not underweight, does all of those things. It makes them live longer lives. It makes them live less painful lives, more pain-free lives. It makes them happier and it makes them healthier. We know that definitively. There are a lot of us that feel like food is love. I, I 
love food myself, so I like I get it. Um, but the best thing we can do for our animals are very lucky that they don't have they don't make their decisions about their food, so we can actually help them have healthy, longer lives. Is keeping them at a good weight. With horses, it's sometimes a little bit easier because we've got our forage and we can weigh our food. And like I said, we don't really weigh our food in dogs and cats. Um, and we can sometimes trust the bag recommendations like a little bit better with horses, um, although not always. With dogs and cats, I will tell you the bag recommendations are always going to tell you to overfeed your pet, almost always, because we all love our pets to be fluffy and chunky and lovable and all the things. And we think food is love. So. I will tell people to start with the recommendation on the bag and then almost certainly cut back. So we've got a couple of ways to know when to cut back. We've got our feline body condition score. This is the official score that they teach us in vet school. So we've got um, chonks, we've got heckin' chonkers, we've got hefty chonks, we've got some chonky cats, right? So <laughs> cats especially are very prone to getting overweight because if we're not having them forage and run around and play, um, then they are very prone to eating too many calories. Um, and so body condition scoring, and I'll give you guys the real one, um, but body condition scoring is a good way to figure out if you are feeding too much or not enough. Um, so on, on this score, and there's a couple, there's different ones, some of them go to five, some of them go to nine, but I felt like this would kind of the simplest one. This score, the three, the green one in the middle here, is the ideal weight. What I think a lot of people feel like is that four, the one right over, is the ideal weight or what they're most comfortable seeing their pet at. Um, people sometimes get a little bit worried. At a three, you can oftentimes see a little bit of a rib when your dog or your cat moves. Um, that is actually appropriate. You know, these, these animals should be able to run around and move and depends on what the breed is, but especially working dogs, things like greyhounds and border collies and German shepherds, um, they should be lean and fit and able to run around and move. Um, they should not be in the, the chonky section of the chart over on the five there. Um, so that is the best thing that we can do with pet nutrition. And you can appropriately manage um, mostly your dog or your cat at pretty much any of the foods as long as they're made for that life stage. They follow all the rules that we've already talked about. If your dog or your cat can't be managed on one of those sort of maintenance type rules, that's when you talk to your veterinarian about doing things like a prescription weight loss diet, which is sort of like a ration balancer for dogs and cats. Um, and that gets into the more, more complicated medical side of things. But in general, just feeding less is going to be the way to go um, as, long as, you, as long as your dog is at the three or at the, the good um, number on this scale. Um, some dogs and cats really want volume in their food, um, and so they they don't feel like they're getting enough. I will say mostly it's the humans that don't feel like they're getting enough. Dogs and cats are really good at training us. I've heard so many times that, you know, Fluffy is going to be mad at me if I don't feed more, and I, you know, Fluffy's a really good trainer. Um, things like adding... Um, Green beans, raw green beans, um, carrots, and apple slices can all be good for both dogs and cats to get in some slightly lower calorie bulk into the food. The other thing that I didn't make a slide about but um, is really important to talk about is table scraps. Um, my favorite um, comparison that I always talk about when I talk about pet weight is um, that a little cheese cube, you know, the ones on the sort of charcuterie boards, a little cheese cube for a, a Labrador or even a smaller dog is the same as a slice of pizza to me. So like me eating a cheese cube, cube doesn't feel like a lot. Me giving my dog a cheese cube doesn't feel like a lot. But if I give my dog three cheese cubes, that's me eating three slices of pizza, which I probably shouldn't be doing for lunch. So table scraps are a really, really big deal. I will tell you most dogs and cats know that um, a kibble is different than a table scrap. So you can give them their own food as a treat and they're gonna be just as happy and they're gonna live longer, healthier, pain-free lives. That is my, is my recommendation. So with that, um, thank you guys for coming to the nutrition talk. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Can we go back to the solution? Maybe. Oh, this one? Yes. On this one? Yep. Mm-hmm.
Ya. Uh -huh. Yeah, so the question is about, um, so the, the dog is at a sort of just under the ideal weight, um, still a, you said a year and a half old dog, so a young dog, um, still eating puppy food, which is good. Is she, is she a large breed dog? A la so yeah, so kind of a large breed dog, so like a lavish thing. Um, so usually sort of larger breed dogs, um, I like them on a puppy food until about 18 months of age, so you're, you're, you're pretty good there. Um, and then they are adding uh, like things like sweet potatoes and rice and everything like that to the food, and the question is, is that okay? Um, the answer is yes, as long as that's less than 10% of her total calories, because we basically count those as treats. Um, and so adding things to the food, uh, you know, I, I would say, no, don't add anything, but you're not gonna listen to me. So adding things to the food is okay as long as it's less than 10% of what your dog is getting. When it's greater than 10%, that's when we worry about unbalancing the diet. We just talked you know, about how important it is to get a really nice balanced diet that somebody got their doctorate to formulate. If we throw in a bunch of other ingredients and totally out of ba out of balance it, um, then that's not going to help. So yes, adding things is okay, and yes, sweet potatoes and rice are both healthy for like are safe and healthy for dogs. Um, as far as that part of the question, just less than ten percent. Okay. I know she has a question for me. <laughs> that's not how you started this. You said you had one for her and one for me, so. Okay. Um, primarily dogs. There's a little bit of research that we have to be worried about cats as well. Um, it's very, it's nowhere near as common. Um, but I would stick with the same recommendations for cats. So I would, I would stay away from those same brands um, and and be careful of those ingredients and all the same recommendations, just to be safe. Um, but we we see it less often in cats. But then again, cats probably go to the cardiologist less than dogs do as well. No, 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 you're good. The, there's um, some dog and cat ones, but I was mostly just checking to see if my sound was okay. Because <laughs> I've apparently... Purina Enrich is a ration balancer. Yeah, I can go through a bunch of them, but like Grow and Win, Enrich, Top Line Balance. And then how does Beet Pulp fit in? How does Beet Pulp fit in? Beet Pulp is a roughage. So that's where it gets a little tricky. And that's where if you're feeding some of the, the diets out there, this is why every time we go out and do a vaccine appointment, we discuss your nutrition with you. Because in particular, if you're feeding beet pulp, you're going to go off the dry weight of your beet pulp, not the wet weight of your beet pulp. So that's a significantly different number, right? So speaking of feathers and lead, wet beet pulp is lead and dry beet pulp is feathers. Um, so, but bee pulp is, is hay, essentially. Now, what happens is if you look on your feed tag, there's going to be a number for fiber. And depending on the feed, you're going to have a higher number of fiber in your concentrate. When you get to like the senior diets, there can be some really high fiber numbers. That's hay as well. So kind of like, but not in a bad way. So in humans, you know, they like to hide sugar in our foods. In horse foods, we like to hide roughage, but it's a good thing in horse foods. But it can mean that you think you're giving them less than you are, and then you start looking at what's in the feed, and you're like, oh, no wonder they won't lose weight. So that's what we're here for. <laughs> you have more horse questions? <laughs> so what about all these big steamers? What about fancy hay steamers? If your horse has asthma, a hay steamer can be really, really useful. Like there's Dr. Carter here. We only have two microphones. So um, Dr. Carter's horse has asthma and she noticed a huge difference in her horse's asthma symptoms when she got a hay steamer. For the average one of us, our horse does not need a, how much was the hay steamer? <laughs> Oh, her husband bought the hay steamer. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. 
Um, they're not cheap. They're like really not cheap and you don't need it. For most horses, you can hose the hay off and get enough of the same effect. Certainly for our asthma horses where we really need to manage symptoms, we're gonna be looking at hay steamers. But for the average one of us, nope, don't necessarily need it. Is that a price back there? Price check, price check. <laughs> So between 1,000 and 3,000, yeah. I think that we could look at other ways to improve nutrition rather than steaming hay for that. Yeah. Great point. You got a Facebook question? So the question is um, Hills versus Royal Canaan or Purina. Hills seems to have significantly lower protein levels than the other two. I would say that it depends on what specific food you're getting. Just like a Purina horse feed, there's going to be various different levels of protein. There's going to be different levels of protein in some of the different types of food from Hills. Um, there are certain, like the maintenance versus the maintenance, there might be different protein levels. They are both balanced. And so that is the important part. Sort of dog and cat food is sort of like a senior food when it comes to horses. It's a complete food. It's everything that they need. Whereas, you know, in, in horses, we've got to balance the, the protein of the concentrate with sort of the fiber of the hay and all of those things. So it will be balanced and appropriate for the life, life stage, as long as there's an APCO label, as long as it states all of those things. Um, so for me, I don't worry too much about that. What I do worry about is what that dog does best on. So again, I sort of blanket recommend those three brands, but it is very true that certain dogs may do better on a Royal Canin adult food versus a Hills adult uh, dog food. And that's just because there's individual variation. Perfect. Um, Jasmine says, it's a dog with congested heart failure that won't eat anything. Any idea what can help him gain weight again might taste yummy. <laughs> All right. So the question is about a dog with congestive heart failure. Um, they won't eat anything. Ideas to help him eat and gain weight. So that's um, dogs with really chronic, really severe diseases. Certainly some of our nutrition rules, you know, fall off the wayside. Um, definitely speaking to your cardiologist or your regular veterinarian about things like anti-nausea medication um, and appetite stimulants um, medication wise can be really, really helpful. Um, heating up the food and doing like a wet food that's really stinky and heating it up can help to encourage um, animals to eat. And then there are some high calorie foods. Um, Hills makes a food called AD um, that is, is meant to be super high calorie so that even if the animal only eats a little bit, um, they're able to still get more of their calories. Um, but certainly with, you know, depending on what stage of congestive heart failure and kind of where they're at in their treatment, um, you know, there's, there's a point in most dogs and cats lives when they can have cheeseburgers from McDonald's and they can they can have whatever they want um, to, to keep them healthy. So. That's it. All right. You got more? You, I can see you. you, like, you can... <laughs> yeah. 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 There's a dad right in front of you, and you're talking about dad pooches, man. Um, One of those? <laughs> yeah. Like, it seems I've had cats all my life, and every single neutered male has that. Yeah. Is that, like, there's really nothing. Yeah, so um, the question is about neutered male cats, and that they have, um, what did you call it, a, a dad pooch? Um, <laughs> It's it's actually called a primordial pouch. That's the the official name for it. Isn't that so weird? The pouch. So so yes, and it's not just neutered males. Most cats do have what we call a primordial pouch. It's sort of a um, like a pendulous flab, for lack of a better term, of, uh, of tissue and skin, um, kind of at their belly. Um, and and no, we don't tend to we don't. That alone doesn't make a cat a, a heck and chonker. Most cats are heck and chonkers, and they have a primordial pouch. <laughs> so, so yes, um, 
it's it's for protection of their of their belly when they hunt and kill things. Not that most of our cats hunt and kill things anymore, but but that's where <laughs> that's what it's for. Tony um, hunts and kills things <laughs> exactly. all the time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a, a otherwise fit and trim cat with a waist, both from the top and the side. Um, that you kind of ignore the primordial pouch and you see that nice tuck of a waist, that can be an appropriately body conditioned cat. And with a little bit of a pouch, that's okay. That's normal for a cat, not normal for a dog. So when you look down, yeah, there should be a waist. The, the tuck yeah. in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe not there. There's no side pouches, just, just the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Are there any activity recommendations for cats or is it strictly diet control? Um, unless it's the cat's idea, diet control is probably the easiest. Um, that being said, I talked about my own cat earlier. When I was in college and I had more free time than I do now, I would set up obstacle courses for my cat to get to his food. Um, and that worked really well to help him lose weight actually. Uh, it was amazing. Um, so yes, getting your cats to play and actually like a cat's normal um, process would be to hunt, feed, sleep. And so if you can actually encourage your cat to play um, with, a, with a toy, with a laser pointer, running around the house, throwing food, my cat loves to go catch food you know across the living room and then feed them and then you'll notice them go nap that is incredibly healthy for them it's a great habit to start when they're kittens and they're have energy and are willing to do that and then good luck continuing it into adulthood some of them will some of them won't like i said it's the cat's choice but activity is a great option all right all right that was a lot of information yeah. As usual, like you guys are here, you can ask us questions when we're done. The rest of you guys out on Facebook land, if you want to drop questions below, we'll try to get to them. And you guys in YouTube, don't forget to ask us questions too.